All right, so good evening. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Karen Hudson. We're going to start now. I'm acting president of the Black Educators Association. And we're so pleased that you've joined us tonight to talk to be part of our education town hall meeting. And it's called Envision Your Education. We are not done yet. And this is the beginning of other conversations which will take place in the near future. We're also grateful for the collaboration of the Office of African Nova Scotian Affairs and the Black Culture Center. And tonight I will be your moderator along with Ms. Rachel Ross, who is the chair of our curriculum committee for the Black Educator Association. And before I begin, I want to recognize that we're on unceded Mi'kmaq territory. As well, I want to also pay homage to our African ancestors who have laid the foundation for us. And the BA has been in this fight for justice. Oh, before I start, um, please um, mute your microphone. And this can be done by clicking on the microphone icon on the lower left side of your Zoom application. The BA has been in this fight for justice, equity, and against systemic racism barriers that Blacks have faced for over 400 years within the education system. BA is the oldest grassroots organization and has been in existence for over 50 years. And to this date, we have a small uh, group of individuals who work there. Our director of programs is Ms. Jackie smith Harriet, And then we have Donna States and Carrie Johnson and also the admin assistants. Our focus at BA will always be on our black learners because black lives matter. And we believe it begins with education. Education is only one piece of the puzzle to securing equality of, for black people. And the current Black Lives Matter movement has elevated the work that must be done in order to address systemic and racist practices that continue within our province. Our children cannot continue to be left out of their history. Our leaders, the politicians, policymakers, anyone who have influence, they cannot continue to be silent. The BLC report must be part of our plan moving forward. We are in a pivotal time in our history and we must influence the educational landscape of our students. So tonight we have a wonderful panel who will address the questions posed by you and discuss any concerns you may have pertaining to education. But there's a few housekeeping rules. One I just mentioned to you in terms of uh, muting your microphones. Uh, for those who are joining by telephone, you can press six to mute or unmute your microphone. Um, please note that the chat box or the chat function is um, available for participants. Try not to um, engage in personal information because other people can actually see what you write there. If you would like to participate or make a comment, please click on the reaction icon on your toolbar to raise your hand or type your question or comment in the chat window. And Miss Rachel there will either, you can either press nine for those who are doing my telephone. You can get Rachel to pose a question to the panel or you can ask the question yourself, but please let her know what you prefer. Keep it to a minute please so that others can participate in the discussion um, so that everyone has an opportunity. Let's remember to share and respect each other's views and comments. And so before we begin, I just want to leave you with this quote from Nelson Mandela. Action without vision is only passing time. Vision without action is merely daydreaming, but action with vision can change the world. And that's what we're here for tonight. I'm going to call on Ms. Ann Johnson McDonald, who will be our first panel panelist. She's from the community of North Preston, has been a public educator for the, over 25 years. She recently returned to her home community school to take on the role of principal of Nelson Weiner Elementary. Ann serves on the board of the Black Educators as the BA Development Chair. And during the COVID-19 pandemic has been active participant of the educational support leadership team for African Nova Scotian students organized through the African Canadian Service Branch. And she will begin the discussion with the vision of education and how it has changed since her time in school and what she sees now in education. 
is Ann Johnson McDonald. Thank you, Karen. Um, indeed, it is an honor and a privilege to be a part of this town hall um, discussion and indeed an honor to be a part of this community that's on the screen in front of me. Um, my vision. I long to see the day when our African Nova Scotian students are able to live in a society and be educated by a system that respects who they are, appreciated, or, or sorry, who they are and appreciated who they are and expects them to reach the full potential that they are just destined to be. That is their potential for excellence. I came to school as a student during the 1960s and 70s, and I don't have to tell you of the marginalization the education system infused upon our communities during that period. Limited secondhand resources and books, streaming, auxiliary classes, guidance counselors encouraging us to take general and non-university prep courses in high school. Um, not much was expected of us, and the system was designed to keep us marginalized, but we persevered. Many who, are who were streamed in auxiliary or general courses returned to upgrading as adults. Some even went on to community colleges and universities to establish their careers and start their own businesses. Then came the special education policy designed originally for students with high medical needs, but somehow, again, the system made it uh, the policy to marginalize our African Nova Scotian students through unwarranted individualized program plans, IPP. And, and I saw that, witnessed that. Again, I don't have to remind you of the generation of generations of youth that has been negatively impacted. Activism such as the class action suit, the Black Report, and the activities of community organizations such as BEA, BUFF, and now um, the Black Lives Matter movement continue to name it and expose the anti-Black racism that exists in our education system. Throughout my professional career, one might say that I have been typecasted, so to speak, to work in particular types of schools. Well, let me tell you, I have gone to these schools through a divine purpose. I pray before I take on any job. And a heartfelt desire to impact our students in a positive way. As an administrator, uh, as an administrator I actively emphasize um, transformation of school culture with an emphasis on high expectations of excellence. I expect all of our students to reach excellence. And at the school level, it starts with culturally responsive pedagogy, CRP, looking at the levels of culture, exposing systemic barriers and the effects of racism, and begin the building of cohesive transformation with staff and school community. This must certainly include emphasizing and empowering students with the language of excellence and in reference to our African Nova Scotian students, understanding and taking an Afrocentric approach. And uh, that's my vision. That's what I want to see for our students. Thank you, Anne. I'll next introduce our next panel, panelist, which is um, Morgan Garrow. She was born and raised in New Glasgow, is a current grade five teacher at St. Andrew Junior uh, School, Junior High School with uh, SRCE and Annika Nish. She has been teaching there for seven years and is currently completing a Master of Education in Culturally Relevant Pedagogy at St. FX. She's going to speak on the same question around her vision of education and how it has changed since her time in school and what she sees now in education. Ms. Morgan Garrow. Thank you very much. Again, just like to echo the same sentiments. I'm very privileged to be um, on this panel. I recognize uh, a lot of the individuals that are in the, the virtual room tonight um, as, you know, individuals who have really championed um, success for our African Nova Scotian learners, for myself, who has come up in the system. So I just, it's a great privilege to be here amongst you all. Um, what I see now in education, I, I'm not, I don't think I'm that far removed from the education system. Um, I only, you know, graduated X amount of years ago. Um, I don't think personally not, not a whole lot has changed. Um, there's still a lack of knowledge of our history and our school systems from the top down, whether that be the centers of education, um, our principals, and our educators. Uh, we have a lot of uh, Indigenous African Nova Scotian communities in 
the backyards of these schools and um, there's just a lack of, of knowledge of our people and our history. Um, when you look at the streamlining of the P to 6 that recently happened, um, there's a lot of um, false promises in that, that uh, our culture kind of became a tag on um, and not genuinely integrated into the history and into the curriculum um, for our Nova Scotian learners. Um, so that really falls short. Um, in when, As a teacher, you know, uh, when the wheels hit the pavement in the thick of it, I see a lot of our parents um, still frustrated. I see a lot of our students still frustrated. Um, the students that I work with, I see uh, my peers reflected in the students that I work with, uh, going through the same struggles, um, you know, having to use their voice at 10, 11, 12 to educate their teachers, to educate their principals, to educate their peers on their history, much like I myself had to and my peers had to. I see them um, being stereo racially stereotyped, um, being marginalized, um, you know, the list could go on. Um, I see a lot of reflection in, in our today's youth and in what my peers and myself have experienced going through the system. What I vision for our education system, I've been pretty vocal about it um, for a while. I would love to see an Afrocentric school, um, something that's accessible for all of our learners across the province. Um, I find being in rural Nova Scotia that um, our students tend to be an afterthought. Um, we, our students don't get to participate in a lot of the same um, programs or activities or celebrations that happen, let's say, in HRM. Um, so I'd love to see an Afrocentric school or some type of curriculum that kind of diverges from the whole Eurocentric, individualistic, hegemonic type education. Um, I'd like to see something that is um, society-centered, um, that really draws on our collectivism on you know social responsibility and collective change um, you know how diverse viewpoints really strengthen the collective um, so that's what I'd like to see thank you Morgan our next uh, panelist is uh, Barb Hamilton Hinch Dr. Barb Hamilton Hinch she's an assistant professor at the School of Health and Human Performance at the Halsey University She's presently done several research, but one that she's involved in currently is with the um, Inter-University Research Network, where she's working for the Department of Education doing research on black learners. She's heavily involved in the community, and she also sits as a member of several boards, ALI, as well as IMATEP. I will now call on Dr. Barb Hamilton Hinch. She probably doesn't want me to call her doctor, but anyway, for those who don't know her, um, to be the next speaker, and she's going to answer the same question, her vision of education and how it has changed since her time in school and what she sees now happening in education. Thank you, Karen, and yeah, Barb works. I, I always tell folks, and actually I used it today, that uh, I use doctor in the presence of white folks, um, but in the presence of my family who helped me become a doctor, you're my brothers and sisters, my aunties and my uncles, so you've raised me and lifted me up, so you're family. Um, so very honored to be here this evening, and thank you for this uh, this opportunity. Um, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time because I like being more engaged in the discussion and the exchange back and forth. And uh, just listening to Anne um, give her comments, and, and Anne and I are you know a little close in age, but not as close as as people would think. There's, but her experience has mirrored my experience as a child um, going through the public school system and being streamed into classes where sometimes I'd be the only black child. Uh, in my in my classes, and then uh, fast forward to having children and wanting to provide them great opportunities. And my oldest went into French immersion, and my youngest started in French immersion. And seeing them be often the only or one or two in the classroom, and having similar struggles of um, identity and acceptance that I went through, um, you know, 20, 30 years before them, it was very painful. And, and even when I had a, a child who had challenges and some of the folks who supported him are on this, this call and I appreciate that support that he received. And people not seeing his brilliance. And the only people who saw his brilliance were often black teachers. And, and that was very, very hard for me and having to advocate for my child in a school system that didn't want him to succeed. 
to the point that I sometimes had to tell white principals, do not be afraid of me, because if you're afraid of me, you'll be afraid of my child. Um, Because I did not back down from getting resources and supports for my child and and did it in whatever way I had to. So even in terms of the the research, which I'm not going to, you know, take today to do, there will be presentations about that later, um, hearing the pain of parents um, in 2020 and 2019 and how their children are still being streamed into courses and placed on IPPs and, and not being treated as excellent and seeing the excellence in them. And, and one of my colleagues who's on this line has, has me very conditioned to be careful of using the term achievement gap, which is what the school board wants us to use, and very conscious of the power in language and, and, and the language that we, we speak into existence. So I, I, I'm very guarded in the language that I use in talking about our learners and our children, um, and, and that's very important. So a vision for me is one where um, an education that reflects all of my black children and all of their greatness and all their excellence And if that can't be in an Afrocentric school, then we have to take over a system that doesn't want us and make it our system. So I need to see my children reflected in the teachers, in the curriculum, in the administration, in the facility custodians and staff. And reading one of my colleagues' uh, book a long time ago when we did the Afrocentric cohort in education, he talked about the custodian was the person who protected him, who took care of him. So from the top of every person involved in the public school system to the person sitting at the front desk needs to reflect the beauty and greatness that is blackness. And, and that excellence needs to be celebrated throughout. Um, so that's my vision. And, and, and if, those, if, if we can't have that, then having people who understand our excellence and us not having to fit into a system that doesn't want us, but creating a system where we're celebrated. Thank you, Ms. Harp. And our last panelist for this evening will be um, Kenneth Fells. He's a past uh, president for BEA, served over two terms. He has been probably um, one of the only individuals I know who has been an administrator at all levels, being elementary, junior, and senior high. He was the um, race relation person for... Um, South Shore, I don't remember. Um, He's presently um, with the African Canadian Service Branch and um, he's heavily involved in the community as a community activist and he's part of 902 Man Up. He's going to answer the same question as well, vision of education and how it has changed since your time in school and what you see now in education. Mr. Ken Phelps. Thank you, everybody. It's so glad to see so many folks. Um, first and foremost, I, I acknowledge my elders, those African elders, and I also want to acknowledge the warriors, those who protected this land, unceded territory, the Mi'kmaq and Malisi people. I want to start with a quote. You've got to heighten the contradiction. You must have the confrontation, and out of that, you have a resolution. But without that contradiction, there is no resolution. That's Dr. B.A. Rocky Jones, a mentor and always been a great supporter. For you folks that don't know, I brought my history with me. I am the child that you're talking about tonight. My vision came from our communities, my elders, my pastor, who believed that as a 12-year-old, I could teach Sunday school, primary students. My love, my passion has always been the youngest children. My great-grandmother, with a background in cadets and military regular forces, hone my instructional skills and my technique. How this changed was a result of how I was being treated in school. As a result of the systemic and overt racism, I was willing to to be able to reach out to any student. To this day, I love all the children that I work with, knowing them first, teaching them first. Where they were, always lifting them up, to be proud of their heritage, their beauty, their self-confidence was the most important. I did not want them to be treated like me. That came from Sunday school, all black environment, and it was all that. But as a student in grade 11F, you know, as Ann Johnson McDonald and Barb talked about streaming, can you imagine being in a high school in grade 11F? Huge, emphasizing 
with this one teacher talking about melon every day, shaming me in class. He was stuck in the aftermath of the civil rights era and the dawn of the neoliberal era of the 1970s. Teacher in primary, first day in school, first day in school. A fellow named Kenny Kelly pulled the little girl's braid. Kenny Fowles got the blame, sat in the corner for the entire day. Great way to start my education. Always continually activist as a five-year-old when a teacher told me I had to color the leaves yellow or green. Got sent home. Brought the purple leaves back with my mother because the leaves were purple, just like by my house. Grade three, they thought I was so cute they wanted to keep me in grade three. As an 11-year-old walking to where my mom worked as a washerwoman, couldn't go in the front door, had to go to the back door. Remind me of my grandfather sitting on the back doorstep, not being able to go uptown after 6 o'clock. Police moving them on. So you can imagine grade 6 being bullied every single day because I got sent back to grade 4 because I couldn't comprehend my reading skills. Can you imagine? I used to win every contest for spelling words, silver dollar every year, but didn't comp comprehend. So I was well grounded and able to teach because I didn't want children to be like me. You got to remember the black family was continued to be disrupted by social services and child protection by overzealous staff members back when I was growing up. This was a consistent dismantling and off balance tactics used to maintain control and power of black families in the African Nova Scotia community. Those folks, folks who can remember, the poor houses, the psyche, before they had family allowance, the Negro Education Fund. So yes, I was a pan-Africanist using the Malcolm X approach by any means necessary to support our learners. But by supporting all learners, I supported our black children as well. Black Panther Initiative, those breakfast programs, dental clinics. When I went to an Afrocentric school, it was no problem for me to morph that Afrocentric modeling and utilize the restorative circle approaches to educate with intentional instruction and culture relevant pedagogical approaches. It was all about the love. It's all about giving back as my elders taught me. And with that, I'll stop. Thank you, Mr. Fells. Um, at this time, I don't know if there's any questions. I'll defer this to Rachel in terms of any comments within the chat. If not, I do have a, a question to pose. <clears throat> so my next question, Rachel, did you say no? Okay. <laughs> But yeah, there's no questions right now. Okay. So my next question for the panelists is, um, how did COVID-19 expose the limitations for black learners? And um, any person on the panel would like to answer that? Barb, Ken, Morgan, Ann? So how did COVID-19 expose the limitations for black Can learners? start this time? Go, oh, sure. Thank you. So how did COVID-19 expose the limitations of black learners? Well, it exposed the marginalization of the community. It exposed the very things that the black report suggested 25 years ago. And that we had moved the needle for our black students of African ancestry who are indigenous to the province of Nova Scotia. How racism is, racism is systemic and has been part of many foundational aspects of society throughout Nova Scotia's history and can be manifested in both individual attitudes and behaviors as well as formal and the unspoken policies and practices within those institutions, conscious and unconscious, conscious and unconscious as well as implicit. You just got to look at page 28, the black report, when they said that it should be a branch, and then it took 25 years to get that. Continuous low expectations, no Afrocentric modeling, no Afrocentric school, 
it exposed too many groups reaching for the limited, the limited level of expectations for our students. I remember one time meeting an administrator who asked me what I would do. And I suggested to that administrator that if you give me $20 million, I would get my own, get our staff together and develop our own Afrocentric school and then watch and learn how we did that. That would be my expose of COVID-19. Thank you. And if I can add to that, and I know your intent may not be for us to all add to each question, so I'll, I'll again keep my comments um, short. And, and I think what uh, the COVID-19 also exposed in terms of limitations of black learners is that many of our learners are relationship builders. Um, they learn through relationships. And even though some of our students have access to technology and had some support at home, it wasn't the same as going into the classroom. And we also need to recognize the fact that not all parents are coming from spaces where their parents may engage in education. So that was also a gap. And, and the way that our children are being taught, and I still have one in the, in the system, isn't necessarily the way we were taught. So even some things that we thought we could do quite easily have become more complex. And as soon as we begin to teach the way we used to teach, where we were taught, our children get frustrated, they get anxious, they get angry, and they tell us we don't know anything. And, and I, I even hear that in my household where, you know, I teach at a university, but I still don't know anything. So I, I take that from the, from the place where it is of love and frustration that our children are going through. Um, the other thing is that school for some kids was a place of safety. Uh, we have exposed so many children to situations where they may be experiencing abuse. And, and, and some of you on this call was that safety net for students. You were the face that they looked for every day to protect them, to support them, to make them feel excellent and loved. And, and that was taken from so many, so many children. Um, and it also made parents very vulnerable and, and even had to expose their weaknesses or their inabilities to their children when they weren't able to provide their children with some of the things and resources that they needed. So building on what, what, uh, what Kenny said, not repeating what he said, um, and it's, it, I am very fearful of how our children are gonna be further behind um, when the fall happens. And, 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 and I see that, uh, even based on some of the, the research that I've been doing around where our children are and where they can be because of a system that hasn't embraced their excellence. Did, um, did anybody else want to um, respond to that question? If not, then Rachel is going to... I just to want to add one thing there. Yeah. Just, just to remind everybody that, uh, just like Barbara alluded to, you have to remember one of the things that exposed COVID-19, it exposed that we not only came from segregated communities, we're still in those segregated communities. So if you understand how the education system worked through segregation, uh, my best example of that was when um, the folk from North Preston came down to Graham Creighton High School the very first time, and they turned the bus around and sent them back. So none of those things have changed. Those relationship building things that we should have had, those transition opportunities that we should have had, were never navigated by the system. So when I talk about the systemic barriers, what has changed since segregated times to the Black Report to today? COVID-19 did nothing more than expose those limitations for the internet, communication, food for our children, food for our children, like parents who are incarcerated, grandparents supporting those children, having to deal with four or five children all day long, where they used to be fed at school, that's that wraparound program that I was referring to. Sorry for taking all that time, but the passion for me for that one. I'd like to just add something too, if that's all right. Um, something that I noticed, um, and I'm, I'm only speaking from my experience, uh, you know, where I teach at, uh, I feel like we're really pushing with culturally relevant pedagogy, cultural responsive pedagogy, whatever you want to call it. I think COVID really exposed, if you want to flip that, 
um, and show expose the limitations of the system, I think it really exposed the lack of understanding around CRP uh, because what a, a fant- like you everything was at your feet about uh, to how to engage in a culturally responsive way. The kids were in their homes, you were in your home. Um, what a way to slow down and build uh, authentic relationships, make your content, your cur- curriculum more relevant to the lives of your students. And I'm going to be, you know, fairly honest, I think a lot of our educators struggled with that. They pushed material out onto the Google platforms and said, good luck. Um, how many, you know, educators engaged in Google Hangouts and, you know, regularly checked in with their students. So I think um, when we're talking about culturally relevant pedagogy, because it just seems to be the flavor of the, of the year, you know, this is, you know, what we've been really, I know in, in my Center for Education, that's what we're really pushing. But I think it really exposed misconceptions and, you know, what we're really not doing in terms of culturally responsive pedagogy. Miss Rachel. So I have a question from somebody who is following on YouTube. Um, and so it's from Tina Frazier and she asked, uh, she mentioned many of our children start out in daycares across the province. And she wanted to know how can early childhood educators be, su- be supported to support our children? I think with early childhood educators, it's, it's, uh, we have to, again, emphasize um, the importance of that cultural relevance even within the daycare system. I mean, I'm, I'm familiar with the daycares that are in, within our black communities, and, and I've seen the strength of the children that come out of the daycares that are within their black community. They, they, they come into the public school system with a, a sense of... Um, strength and security. Sometimes it gets lost once they get into the public school system, but just, just having those, those homegrown early childhood educators from the community, I'm not sure if the same thing happens in um, other daycares that are within the city, or within other areas. So I think um, the same philosophies have to be instilled within the daycares as well of, of the, the culturally relevant pedagogy within the daycare curriculum and, and child care. And and um, and for our children, they need to be exposed to that Afrocentricity, that strength that we get from grounding them into who they are right from the start. Because as we know, once the children studies have shown, once children hit school and hit the, the, that school age and school system, something happens. Because our babies start out ahead. The research showed that our babies uh, in in the psychosocial development and in, in the, the education development, they start out ahead. But something happens when they reach age five that causes them to fall behind. And, and we know what that something is. It's the impact of that some systemic racism. So we need to, to be cautious, um, what's the word? Cautious to, to focus on um, grounding our children, even at the, the early childhood level. Can I add to Anne? That's an excellent um, response, Anne, and, and a really good question, Tina. And, and I thank you for that question um, because in some of the stuff that I am looking at, um, we are looking at early childhood uh, development. I work with uh, Jesse Lee McCausick from Mount St. Vincent University, whose area of expertise is in early childhood development. And, and in that, we're looking at the use of EDI, early development instrument, and how that is used against our children um, in grade primary. And even as a, a parent who had two kids who went through the school system, I didn't know that my children were being tested as early as grade primary by a teacher to find out how they're going to be successful in the school system, how they're interacting, how they're socializing. And, and children are being evaluated as soon as they step foot into that classroom. And, and I said, and whose lens is it? What lens are they using to evaluate my child? So if my children went to a predominantly white school and sat in a classroom, and if they're not socializing with kids in that classroom, then they're the ones being determined to have socialization issues, not the kids that aren't socializing with them. So if my children come from a predominantly safe black community or safe daycare 
where people look like them, sound like them, respond to them, and now they're in a predominantly white classroom and they're backing up, all of a sudden they're the ones that have the issues around social development. So we really need to be cognizant of who's doing the testing, what those uh, standardized tests are looking for, and how they're being used. And we don't ask our system enough questions. So I think that our early childhood developments need to cheat a little. Try and get your hands on those instruments that are being used in grade primary. Get our kids ready before they start school. Because like Ann said, research is showing that they start well ahead of the others who are going into school. And then by the time they reach grade three, all of a sudden there's, there's something that's happening. And the school system has already determined what they can and can't do. And they, the low achievement and expectation of our children start early, predominantly in classrooms where they don't see themselves reflected and where they're not being pushed. And so as early childhood educators, it's always celebrating the brilliance in our children, making them feel valued and appreciated, and the I see you. Because sometimes once they start our public school system, suddenly the school system does not see us. And that is problematic. And then you're fighting to be seen. And I often would even do a test with my, with my university students. And I would say, sit, sit them in a classroom. And I would show them what happens if a child is called upon often to answer questions. Their confidence comes up. They become assertive. They know how to answer the questions. And if our young black children are putting their hands up to ask questions and no one's calling on them, they're going to stop putting their hands up. So encourage young children to ask questions, doesn't matter if they know the answer, to answer questions, to be engaged as much as possible and challenge them, challenge them. Because we know that eventually our school system is just going to say they're not going to challenge them in the same way. And, and that actually scares me what happens to our, to our babies when they get into a system that isn't meant for them to succeed. Can I just add something to that, please? For sure. So I do certainly agree with uh, Barb when she talks about EDI. It, 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 really, does, it really does place um, place our children in a real vulnerable situation. But historically, what I would suggest is that we have to remember who the first preschool teachers were. If you remember the Black United Front put the Head Start program together, it's all across the province to the Black United Front. And the precursor for that was the 4-plus program that came out with the Central North and Halifax and other places around, uh, around the Halifax area. And then we developed the uh, Afrocentric um, pre-primary program in Nelson Winder and other places across the province. But then you could see how the system itself, those systemic barriers come in and play a significant role in uh, taking away from a benefit or something that gave our children a little bit of a step up. So remember, the, the Head Start program started in 1970. HRCE went to the province and changed that by bringing in the four-year-old program to the province. So now our students that were trained as four-year-olds are going to be a little bit more behind. So I do agree with Barb, when she talks about, or the sentiment that we needed to look at the advantage, but that's something that was taken out of our community because a lot of those first uh, frontline workers were our people. They were those daycare workers back in the day. So please keep that in mind. It's that nurturing piece that comes from an Afrocentric perspective that brings that. All those programs were developed in our community, and the evidence is still there. So when we foster uh, that piece of initiative to support pre-primary programming, we had a huge meeting in Andy Ganesh as pre-primary teachers a while back on this very issue. And this shows you how far we've come. Even though it's still in the Black Report and it stays, it, it, it emphasizes the vision that the Black Report had that we're still not we still haven't got there yet. I think Rachel was going to um, share something. Okay, so there's some discussion in the chat. Uh, Malik had made the statement that staying at home was a possible insulation from systemic racism at, at school. Possible black students might have had to had to deal with the mental, emotional, and psychological break. And he's just asking for this to be considered. 
Any anyone from the panel would like to comment on that? Absolutely, yeah. really. I, I thank you for bringing that up because the mental health is something that we're not talking about, and it did help to have that protective factor, especially if our parents were home to also support them through that challenge. And and I do appreciate the role that you're now playing within the school system and for raising that. And I would love to hear. Um, and I saw you mentioned from students how they managed being at home um, during COVID around both the, the emotional, mental health and, and even their, their, their learning. And you're right, some of them have been protected because of being home. Um, I even think about that, and I'm sure teachers think the same way. I'm not looking forward to going back <clears throat> into the system, especially given what we've gone through around Black Lives Matter and, and tired of the phone calls and the emails of what can I do. Like our students are getting those same darn responses. They have friends that are reaching out to them that never reached out to them before that have been in their circle saying, hey, man, I never thought about this. And, and it, it really troubles me how all of a sudden um, our blackness is awakened as if it hasn't already been awake. And now we are not only having to deal with, the, with that, but even the ridiculous questions that our kids are getting and what we're getting around um, uh, being black in Nova Scotia and Canada and in the U.S. So thank you for, for raising that point. I know the youth that I work, I've been in touch with quite regularly over the course of um, COVID and, you know, even up to as early as, you know, yesterday. Um, and they've been re relieved um, they've had a rough go this year at their school with some racial incidents that um, occurred that weren't dealt with in their eyes appropriately. And it just kind of snowballed and escalated to um, a lot of trauma for them. Uh, so they've been relieved that, you know, they didn't have to be in school surrounded by that because when March break came, um, you could, t I could tell a sense of heaviness in them um, at, um, you know, anywhere from grade five right up to grade 12, having to, to deal with that overt racism. Um, so I could see it in them, the drain, and having to be the ones to vocalize what was wrong to administrators and teachers and having to stand up in classrooms and saying to, you know, combating racist comments from their peers where the teacher said nothing. So um, they've been relieved that they've been home um yeah and i got to the uh Annie ganish had a black lives matter march here not too long ago and Annie ganish is a very small town um but there was three thousand plus people that showed up to this march and at the front were you know our black youth leading that um, march and so they're very much invested in you know what happens in the future and they've got a strong voice um so in the event that we do go back to uh to school, I think they're, you know, they've got a voice that they're willing and ready to use. Yeah, I just want to add that uh, social emotional learning is pretty key to this. Um, as a principal of school, it was always one of the forefront issues that many times we had to deal with, particularly in the, uh, in the black community. So this interesting book was called Why, Can't, Why We Can't Afford Whitewash Social Emotional Learning would probably be a good read. And then it provides five different areas that you might want to consider. Identifying emotions, accurate self-perception, recognizing strength, self-confidence, and self-efficacy. Once we establish those things from an Afrocentric model, you're certainly going to have success in students. So, yeah, COVID did, did certainly expose a lot of things. And uh, one of the ways we can actually support our learners more is to actually build them up, always. Thank you. We have a few more questions from Rachel, from folks from are watching YouTube and from the chat there. Ms. Rachel. Okay. All right. So um, Liz just added that um, 50 years later in her life, perhaps the only recourse is class action suit for the failure of the government to meet the needs of African Nova Scotian learners. And this has been discussed in other regions such as Cumberland and the letter to previous rates relation coordinators, then the money could be put into our education. She's... Hmm. Any reactions or comments? Class actions suit. Always, always have a reaction. You have to remember that, again, that comes with them systemic barriers. I'm always come up front because if you remember, uh, Anne, when we were at Nelson Martin Elementary School, what happened after five years of an Afrocentric environment? 
they took the they they, they said because we became um, amalgamated with the rest of the city that all those uh, ingredients, all those possibilities of reading resource teachers, all those other avenues we had at Nelson Winder, we lost them. What else did we lose? All those fantastic teachers that were working there. So I do agree that that money should be redirected to all of our communities, particularly segregated communities who still have a community school. So there is no doubt that um, those things have an impact uh, uh, in our community, and they certainly had an impact on Nelson Wander Elementary School. Look what happened after that. We went from 106 students to 244, and what was the result after that, after we had other people coming in? So the impact is there. That's where the money needs to go. And, and adding to that, I, I have a, a number of colleagues uh, who have talked about the fact that, um, and I'll, I'll use BEA as an example, but it could be any of our, our educational organizations, that every one of our organizations um, that are supporting black, ward, lawyer, black students, because the next word out of my mouth is going to be lawyers, should have a lawyer on file. So when something is happening in our school system that, are, that is affecting our black learners, that we have a black lawyer that is being retained by the black community that goes in. And that we don't wait for something to happen. The minute we don't feel in our gut that something is right, we call our black lawyers who go with us and advocate and support our black learners. I appreciate the work of the regional educators and student support workers, but there's nothing like having a black lawyer on retainer that goes with you to the school and just dares them to continue to mess up because we also need to recognize the government money that has gone into the different programs that has, that has failed in, in some cases. Not the programs haven't failed, the government has failed us. And so we really need to make sure that we have our ducks in a row and that we have the resources that we need and that we have a team of lawyers on side and ready to fight the issue. The last thing you wanna go in is not prepared. And we have enough examples from over 50 years, as you said, Liz, where our children have been miseducated. In one of my research projects, a parent talked about the fact that they want to do their upgrading and go to the community college to get their GED. And they had to do their testing. And it wasn't until they did their testing that they were told they have a grade three education. So she was able to work through the system get jobs, work, wanted to get a grade 12, and was told she was functioning at a grade three level. We need to have lawyers on side and have them ready to go in and advocate um, for our teachers, our students, our learners. That would be one of the things that I would strongly suggest. And also what that team of lawyers would do would be to ensure that, you know, uh, the follow-up of, say, a clack session suit doesn't fall through the cracks because, as Ken mentioned, a lot of the things that were laid out in the class action suit have gone by the wayside. You can't even find a copy of it. All right, so the next question is from somebody who is watching on YouTube, Nathan Beeler. He says, I'm a music educator. I know there needs to... I know there is a need to rethink culturally responsive music education. I'm interested in any thoughts the panelists have on music education in general. Well, I teach African drumming. I've had an African drumming group since I've gone down to Antigonish. And uh, without fail every year, because uh, I do believe in the grade seven music curriculum, African drumming comes up. Um, and some of my drummers end up in that music class. And there's a, div there's a contrast between, um, you know, the program that Wayne Hamilton um, kind of pushed out uh, many, many moons ago. Uh, Mylon Bor Borden was my instructor. Um, there's a, a difference between the way that our communities have taught African drumming and the way the school system teaches African drumming. So it's a very Eurocentric, Eurocentric ta, ti ti ta, ti ti ta. Um, way of teaching percussion with African drumming. And there isn't a whole lot of historical context given to African drumming and the significance to our communities and our people. 
So um, I know I've had several conversations with our music teacher um, and student teachers who have come, who've had to teach that um, because my drummers land in their class and there's a conflict that arises because I've taught them one way, they've known it one way, and here they're being challenged saying that is wrong. Um, so that would be one, you know, one way to kind of um, to take a look at that uh, because um, the Eurocentric way isn't always the right way. And again, our, our teacher training institutions need to um, wake up and ensure that teachers coming out are equipped to be culturally responsive in, in, in the music uh, programs. And when I think when you mentioned that the grade seven curriculum, I, I was a part of, you know, um, when that first came into being, when Wendy was developing that curriculum, and she had me do a few things. That's gone by the wayside, because I taught it when I was a teacher, and, but then when I became an administrator, I'm walking into schools where the drums are collecting dust. Um, you know, our, our school concerts, are they, are they reflecting our, our children? There's, I'm glad the, the, whoever brought that up did bring that up because it, uh, music is a strong part of our culture. And I think that there needs to be more emphasis within the training institutions and teachers coming out that are teaching music to be culturally responsive and bring that part of our, our students' culture out of them. Absolutely. And there's another piece too, I'm not sure if it's in grade seven or grade eight, grade eight where they look at protest songs. And I can remember going in on my prep period teaching three or four classes um, on protest songs that talked about um, apartheid in South Africa because the, the teacher had, you know, wanted to include, but for some reason couldn't do it themselves, right? So there's that, you know, there's, um, and I've seen it come up here in the comments too about, um, I'm a shit or get off the pot type person. Um, either you're going to do it or you're not going to do it. So, I mean, there's never going to be enough time in the day to learn all these things, but if you're invested in our students and, you know, uplifting them and being culturally responsive, you're going to find the time. So it's as simple as that. Well, just to add voice to that, I mean, uh, I teach African drumming as well, but I don't just teach African drumming. You can't teach African drumming without teaching dance. You can't teach dance unless you have all the instruments. So all the instruments that go at African drumming, they're required too. So if you're going to run a program, that's where you get Eurocentrized because anybody can get a djembe and do a djembe. But if you have all the instruments and you understand how they work together, that's about our community. That's where community becomes involved. So to the questioner, um, it's not just about the drumming. There are all aspects of it that play into it. And you can't just use the, uh, an Afrocentric model which precludes the drumming because there's jazz, there's blues. There's all those other uh, pieces of music which you can utilize all those instruments in. So if you are interested in a, a volatile and versatile program, then you have to incorporate all those pieces and what they mean. Because our story comes from people taking cardboard boxes and playing banjo. You know, you know we, we did the history of the music at Dalhousie when I was in the transition year program. Eight hours of, sorry, 12 hours programming and, and playing the instruments too. That is when you're invested in the program. So all those supports, um, you know, we, I, we can probably send you some, um, some websites actually to actually get to, to, to find out uh, how to incorporate a lot more of the music into the music. And it's not about outcomes, it's about getting the feel from the children. Because our children don't have no problem dancing, I can tell you that. And moving. If the music's good. And I'll, I'll just add on really quickly, I appreciate your, your, your question. And I think we need to also look at who's teaching our teachers. Um, both depending on where they are within their education and, and even when they make the decision to become a teacher. So I celebrate the fact that my... Um, 17 year old says he wants to be a math teacher and a, a phys ed teacher. Go figure, uh, Kenny and, and, and Rachel. But <laughs> yeah. anyways, that's what he's saying right now. That might be a different story another day. My bodyguard. <laughs> and in, in saying that, it's, it's being aware of what he's learning throughout those steps that he can then apply when he goes into a classroom. And, and I, I, I don't think 
And I think we need to bring more guest speakers into the classrooms that are diverse and reflect our children from whatever cultures they may be, but we're here to speak about our black learners. And get rid of those, I'm going to say it, those damn white master drummers who are being invited into our schools to teach our kids drumming. Say it again, say it again. Because if you are being taught, and they're using the word, we're master drummers, we've been taught by the master drummer in Ghana, and I'm here as the white man to teach you how to drum, that's problematic for me. And so if we're going to allow them to come into our system, and our kids are seeing that, and that's, oh, that's what a master drummer looks like. Wrong message. And our children are getting so many wrong messages in other ways that that's the last place they need the wrong message because we are musicians. We are drummers. We are orators. We are songwriters. We are all of that. And that needs to be brought into that classroom and celebrated. Even when I think about, so you're all getting me passionate. Even when we talk about giving the the land acknowledgement. Um, in university, I, I, I take <laughs> full leniency um, to say, y'all got a little blackness going in you because you're all our descendants of Lucy. So we can give the land acknowledgement, but mankind, humankind started in Mother Africa. And I give Mother Africa first honor. And then I recognize my indigenous brothers and sisters, but I let them know who they came from. And I also say that if there's any of you here who don't want to be taught by a black professor, please leave now because you're going to hear about black issues. You're going to hear about racism. You're going to hear about systems that don't work for me. And, and we need to, and I, I know that I'm in a different position at a university, but we need to recognize that as teachers, the power that we have as educators. And as our older Christians would say, the tongue is a sword. And if nothing comes out of there that's positive, if we don't reflect positivity in everything we do, then our children are going to get the wrong messages. So we need to go back, and sometimes it takes a little bit of extra work, teach ourselves um, a little bit of things that we can bring into the classroom. And if you don't know it, then reach out and ask somebody to help you. Because we need to do better as educators. Ashe, Barb, Ashe, because it's important that um, our folk do know that... Uh, when we go in the classroom or when we, we, we do that first note, I did the same thing. I acknowledged my elders and then I acknowledged the warriors. But one of the things I wanted to establish as well is that uh, I work with four-year-olds just in case anybody wants a drummer works with four-year-olds. So I love working with them, happy people. But you have to make sure you have the right size drum for them, for those children. You can't have the big bass drum. You have to have the right size drums. So that's another thing that I, I wanted to add that I forgot to add for the person who asked me as a question. The right size drum for those children, particularly preschool, is very important. And they like the drum too, believe me. And try it in the learning center. That's another specialty. If you got some, got some chance to do that. We have a few more questions that from Rachel. Okay, so our next question is from Archie Beals. Uh, he's asking, how do we as a community ad adequately academically prepare our children for post-secondary? We know that the public school is not doing it, so we as a community have to. It's, it's interesting you asked that. I, I was speaking with my daughter who just graduated from a University of Ontario, and she was reminiscing back to her high school experience. And you know, quite often our children come out of high school just not feeling prepared for university. Mm -hmm. But she named uh, a teacher from our community that she said, Mommy, you know, this teacher really pushed me. She had high expectations of me. She said, you know, she would say to me, Antifa, I'm not accepting that essay from you because it's not up to par where it should be, and you're going to university. You know, so, um, I think that's where the emphasis needs to be. We, our, our students in high school need to be expected to produce excellence, and they need to be pushed to produce excellence, not mediocre. Um, they may gripe and complain, but they will appreciate it afterwards. Because at the time, she would get frustrated. Oh, mommy, Miss So-and-So is picking on me. She's da 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 But now she's saying, you know, now I'll say her name, Miss Kane. She says, you know, I really appreciate what Miss Kane did because she pushed me to excellence. So that's important. I think that can start younger than high school. 
Um, I see it. I teach grade five. I see it now with my own, you know, African Nova Scotian students pushing for excellence, set, setting that high bar, setting those expectations for them that I'm not accepting that. Let's, you know, let's, you know, do better. So I think you can, you can start that building that and using that language even younger. So and you're, abs you're, you're absolutely right because that same daughter, she's Miss Talker, but she had a grade two teacher. Again, someone from an African Nova Scotian teacher who pushed her, got her to set goals. And, you know, and I think that's what started her on that road to saying, you know, I'm going to achieve. Because even the grade two, two teacher was saying, okay, you're at this reading level. By next month, I want you at such and such reading level. I know we don't usually tell students that, but that black teacher told my daughter that when she was in grade two. And my daughter would set that goal. Mommy, by the end of this month, I'm going to be at reading level whatever. So I agree with you. And that's why I'm an advocate for a P to 12 school. That way at that school, I get them for the whole time. And the most important value system is I can bring in an IB program or an Afrocentric program or specialty math, specialty skill trades, and work whatever, whatever venue that children want to work on to make sure that they meet the heights that they have to go to. Because it's not all about academic school and university. We still need those plumbers. We still need those folks who fix cars. And we, you know, if you can imagine our children, our males and our females, can take apart a car and put it back together and they never even seen it. And they never had the training. So let's be real about what kind of education we need. We need that school. We need that school. And, and if I can just chime in quickly, you know, Mr. Fells, I agree with that in terms of if you've got the right mix around it, an administrator that recognizes that. Um, having been a product of a, of a P to 12 school where that support, those supports weren't there, uh, it's very challenging uh, to exist in those places because you don't have a space to actually recuperate from the damage that's done from P through 12. So in the right circumstances, the right conditions, absolutely. But uh, being a product of a school that was a consolidated school from P through 12, um, you get you get labeled by grade three or four based on the performance of a relative or someone you know from your community. That's uh, that's a, a long time to survive in an environment that isn't conducive for you. And just adding to the question um, in terms of post secondary, and I heard post secondary, so for me that included both uh, community college and and university, and, and even on a call earlier today. Uh, and even when I think about uh, the Black Student Advising Center where I used to work and, and even some of the early times there, is that we, did not, we don't see ourselves reflected in post-secondary institutions, so even let alone the public school system. And, and we were talking about where our universities are located, and we were speaking specifically today about Dalhousie and St. Mary's being located in the South End. And those of us who grew up in Nova Scotia, the South End was a place you didn't go. It was a place that was considered very racist. You weren't welcomed. Uh, many of us have parents who work there uh, doing day work. And it was a place that just was not safe for black people. And so we need to make these spaces safe early for our children. They need to see themselves reflected in these spaces. And they need to feel they can walk on those campuses early, just like anybody else. So as soon as you can expose them to a university campus, be it through a, a camp, be it through just taking a walk through, be it through you're going back to see someone that you were engaged with, whatever, get those children on those campus, both at the community college and at the university, as soon as they can walk, um, as soon as they know there's something happening besides public school and this is another building that I may be able to get into. We need to expose them early to the spaces and make them claim those spaces early. And then when it comes to the work itself, the academic work, we recognize that our school system does not push our children in the same way they need to be pushed because some don't believe that our children are going to university. And then when they get there, they are in for the shock of their life. And then a lot of our children don't ask for help in public school and it gets even worse in university. They are not going to go to the writing center. They're not going to go for counseling services. They're not going to get a tutor. Because all of those things that they've been told in public school, that resource means that you're not smart, that asking for extra help means you're not smart, they carry that with them into university. So if I need extra help, that means that I'm not smart. That means that I shouldn't be here. And they are the most stubborn at that age 
And so sometimes, and I, and I say this as a parent who had a child who started university, and I was that helicopter parent that no one likes at the universities, and I remember him not doing well, but not coming to me and telling me he wasn't doing well. And said, oh, yeah, mom, I'm doing all the work. I'm doing all the work. Ended up getting an F. And I'm like, what do you mean? I got to call that professor. You told me you were doing work. You told me you were doing well. Why did you get this F? And then he admits, I didn't go for extra help. I got discouraged. I got frustrated. I got behind. But there's no one taking care of our children and monitoring that support mm -hmm. for them. And so it's very, very challenging for our children um, when they're not comfortable in asking for help because it's seen as a form of weakness. And, and, and we got to work on that um, for our learners. But we need to make them feel that this is a space where they need to belong. So when there's programs that exist, and I'm not tooting um, Dow's horn because there's many programs out there. When there's programs that are existing for our children, engage them. Get them connected to plans. Get them connected to Imhotep Legacy. Get them connected to um, Afrocentric Learning Institute, to the Supernova Camps whatever we can connect them to early. And if we need resources to connect them, then we need to find those resources. But we need to get them to see themselves as part of the system early. And even when they're there, and I don't want to belabor it more, uh, we need them to think about what's next. I always ask any black student on campus, so what are you doing after your first degree? Because some of them don't see themselves going on to a master's or a PhD because no one told them that's possible. So you need to speak excellence into them throughout from the time they start going to daycare to the time they start going to university to the time they finish their PhD or whatever path they're going, be it um, medical science, be it a teacher, continue to speak that excellence and see them being represented. Can I just piggyback on, on that too? Um, speaking from, you know, again, being in a rural area, um, our students get left out. If it's not St. of X, um, which has its own issues, uh, they don't see themselves at Dal or SMU or whatever because they've never stepped foot on those campuses. So I very much agree with you starting that, um, getting them on campuses uh, when they're young. And, and, and I would love to see some of these programs extend down our way in our region because our students are left out. They're missing out on opportunities. The only time they get to perhaps visit Dal or SMU is in their grade 12 year um, when a support worker or a student advisor um, arranges a tour. Uh, and that's too, that, in my opinion, is too late. Um, you, again, build that excellence in them that, you know, this is, in the, this is your possibility. You can do this very, very much earlier. And we need to bring back the Parents as Career Coaches um, workshop, I, I, and more specifically the Afrocentric Parenters Career Coaches Workshop. I had a privilege of attending one it was facilitated by Archie and I forget the lady in Truro. Um, but it equipped parents to support their students as they're going through school and headed towards, um, you know, graduating in high school. I'm just thinking fondly of the, the science camp that Dr. Agnes Calise used to run at uh, St. of X. And I got to attend that twice and I did Camp Coogee and Math Camp, fantastic experiences. Um, but for rural kids, that, that those present challenges. Getting there, um, they're in competition with kids from HRM. It's not equitable. Um, so when we're talking about how we can bridge that gap between high school and post-secondary, we need to take a really good look at how um, our resources are being distributed across the province equitably to all of our students. Great. Uh, next question is from Dr. Wanda Thomas Bernard, and she first of all thanks uh, for the conversation on education, and she's interested in um, the intersection of disability and African Nova Scotian learners, and wondering what attention is being paid uh, to what our students, our Black learners uh, with disabilities, have in their need in culturally specific context. I nod my head because it's, it's such a good question and it, it goes back and my colleague again that talks about the achievement gap is in my head um, because if we have children, because I think when we look at this term, um, persons with disabilities, children with disabilities, it's so wide reaching 
and, and a lot of you who work with children who have um, disabilities and other challenges understand where I'm coming from. So it's not, again, going to be a one, fit, a one size fits all because their abilities are going to be on different ranges. And again, people come in sometimes um, not allowing the child to first demonstrate what they're capable of, but come in with their own um, preconceived perceptions of what a child can and can't do. And, and, and having a child who had invisible disabilities and struggled through the school system and not have, no one knowing what resources he needed was hard. I, I can tell you as a, as a first voice parent, and, and I remember calling my, my friends who are educators and saying, look, I'm pulling my child out of this public school system because they don't know how to manage my child. And if you can just teach them for four hours a day, I will be so happy and I will pay you what you need to be paid because the school system is destroying my child. And, and that's coming to you as a parent who struggled and struggled from early education and, and had very little support um, of advocates working with my child to make sure he got the resources he needed. And so... Again, the resources that we did get access to did not look like us. They were not culturally relevant. They didn't um, speak to the needs of me or my family. And in a, a, another part of my, my research that I'm working with around looking at exactly the same issue, a parent who took one of the programs at the IWK said the only time in her training of going through like, the IWK Strongest Family or one of their, their trainings where they saw a black parent who was working with a child with a disability was when they were told they were disciplining their child wrong. So even in the training that is being provided to parents that are working with children who have challenges, the material that they're giving is also reflecting black parents in a negative way. So above and beyond this, the public school system that is built for one size fits all, and, and, and if you don't fit in the box, then get out of the box, we need to look specifically at our children that have a varied number of um, disabilities that are uh, affecting their learner, their learning, and how can we support them? Because there are not very many qualified, and, and I don't know, you all know better than me, um, resources and people that are of African descent working with children with disabilities. So again, they're having somebody telling them that they can't or this is your limit. And, and that's another whole area that we need to begin to do more research and more support in because that is a group that's being left behind. And that's often when you'll see, and, and I'm not saying that IPPs are bad for everyone, but that's often when you see IPPs being pulled out and children being wrongfully placed on them because no one sees the greatness in their disability. Just, just to build upon what um, Dr. Barb, Ms. Barb was saying, um, we're, we're, we find ourselves depending upon systems, both the medical system and the school system, that um, relies on assessment batteries that were not designed for our children. The assessment pieces that um, are developed out of research, but the research is not on our children. So then our children are, are put through these assessment um, pieces that just aren't relevant. And like Barb was saying, then it gives, you know, doesn't give the adequate results. And so, so then now you're programming based upon an assessment that hasn't given an adequate result. And, and that can become very problematic for our, for our children. So like you said, there needs to be some different research done. And the research is out there. We in Nova Scotia need to, need to start doing some research and tapping into the research that's out there that can support our children and in particular, in, in response to um, the question, our children that have, you know, so-called diagnosed special needs. So I, I think I'd like to take a crack at that question because um, I've had a lot of work, done a lot of work with uh, our children who had significant cognitive delay and uh, significant um, mental health issues. Uh, we have one young fellow that... Uh, had to be covered up all the time, totally black, just unbelievable. And I, I think answering the question is not to make excuses for anything, but to explain that the systemic barriers that we deal with as black administrators trying to address issues of a culturally relevant pedagogical approach, where we understand that a child's hair needs to be done properly and clean. But if that child's coming from a foster care home, or they come from a blended family, or they come from a single parent family. Those are all pieces that are not part of that question. 
that an administrator might have to deal with. So for me, dealing with a scenario like that, we understand that how many meetings do I have to go to or do we have to go to to ensure that the IWK or mental health prospects or whatever entities within the school system, the student services program, are addressing those immediate needs because it always comes back to the school. Always comes back to the school. And it's not just about dealing with a child when they're in school. It's the two years after they get out of school that we have to take in consideration too because they may be with us. We need to find a place for them to actually continue their education. Part of the problem is it ends at 21 where some children have capacity and ability to go further up to, say, 25. They're not going to grow anymore and they're not going to change any more cognitive than they are, but the system just does not support that. So we're limited in what we can do, and if we're trying to get support for somebody who's 15, 16 years old, and then we can't get anybody on side to provide the services that are necessary, then that child is limited. I can tell you with one, the one particular child driving them ourselves, making sure he got to the IWK, meeting with people, the, the system just backed away from us. But we still stuck with our children providing those culturally relevant pedagogical approaches that are required and the sensitivities that we needed for the parent. We always forget about the parent. The parent is, you know, so emotional, so attached, nobody's interested in their child. So when I look at that question, there are so many facets to the question that could have been asked. But to having dealt with those questions from uh, in a junior high, in an elementary school, and then in a high school, seeing what takes place all the way through, that's one of the areas I think we need to go back and we need to revisit. Got to have guidance on site, student services on site, the learning center on site, IWK. Uh, all those aspects have to be there and meet at the table to resolve those issues. And there has to be parent support too. That's the best way I can answer that question. All right. So um, thank you for that discussion. So we have basically 10 more minutes left before 730. And like I said to you earlier, you know, there's so much to be discussed and uh, lots of work to be done. And this is the first of many. But I want, Rachel, there's four questions. If we can keep our um, answers succinctly and um, try to get through those four questions before we conclude for this evening, um, let's try. Let's see what we can do. Miss Rachel? Okay, so um, the next question is from Vanessa Brooks, and she says, so what I'm hearing in my short time as a teacher is that an Afrocentric model in school would work. So what can we do to mobilize and getting an Afrocentric school? And she's ready to put in the work. I think we all... That's a history. Listen, I mean, you know, what can we do? You, you got to get the you got to get the government. You know what you need to do? All these schools that are empty, we just need one for one dollar, and and then we need to show them what to do. That's that's all there is to it. I know we can attract the teachers. We already got the curriculum. We got the people. We just need the students. So, you know, light it up. I still don't know why it hasn't happened yet. Um, we've said it time and time again. It can be done. All these schools that are sitting empty, St. Pat's Alexander School, on and on and on. That's what we got to do. It's, if we, got, we got everything we need. The administration, the beautiful people, there's no money to buy the building. It only costs a dollar. Anybody else would like to respond to that same question that um, Bell said, or we'll go to the next one? Well, I know that you said keep it keep it sweet. So I uh, I know it doesn't help you much uh, right now, um, Vanessa. But I, I can tell you that people are talking about the next steps, and we are getting teachers on board who are looking at saying, "I'm ready to leave um, and retire early if there's these opportunities." So we are beginning to gather those names of people um, to see who want, who's ready to step out. Because we talk about the fact that Marva Collins started in her room, although her school wasn't an Afrocentric school, the Muslim school started with one class and then they built up and now have a whole school. So, and, and we don't want to depend on, um, 
on the government solely. We want them, it, it is great if, we, if they um, come on board, but we need to make sure this is ours. And I know that the model that's happening out of Auburn is being um, talked about and celebrated within our school system. So we know that because that precedent has been placed and Nelson Winder for a period of time was seen as an Afrocentric school, and I know that a similar model was tried at Joseph Howe. Um, and, and so the model that is at Auburn has been so successful that I can tell you that at, as an institution, we're looking at pulling cohorts from that students, that, that group of students are getting ready to graduate, to bring them to Dalhousie as a support group of cohort of excellence. Um, and many people are watching that model to see um, how successful it has been. And so if whatever school you are in, there's now that precedent to say, this is happening at Auburn, why can't it happen in our school until we are able to get the Afrocentric school? Advocate in your own school for a similar model that is being done at Auburn and say it was able to happen in the public school system. There's no reason why it can't happen from the elementary school right on up through. And if parents want it, parents need to demand it. The same way we can have a French immersion stream, there's no reason why within a public school system, if parents want to have an Afrocentric stream in the public school system, get that petition, get them to sign for it. The Acadian community, again, this is my passion coming out because I'm so frustrated at this whole process. The Acadian community has lobbied. They have their school. They're going to be opening their school their school soon. We may not have that numbers. We, not, we may not have that same financial means, but we have enough in our school system that we can say, I don't care if I have a classroom of 10 students or whatever you need publicly. I have 10 parents who want this classroom from P to three of their black students, and we're going to advocate for it and make it happen and get the organizations behind you. Don't wait for the school system to give us a school. Don't wait for the school system to say, okay, we're now going to give you. There's a model already in place in high school. Let's make it apply at every level and let's start getting parents signed up to say, I want Vanessa um, Brooks to be my teacher in an Afrocentric stream in your school starting September 2020. That was our model. Yeah, that was what we were going to do uh, to, from Nelson Winder to uh, Ross Rowe and on to Auburn or Co Harbor. But I do agree. We have to start at elementary level in the MERSEN program. And at Nelson Winder, oh, sorry. Didn't mean to cut you off again. At Nelson Winder, we are we are in the process right now of, of bringing back what we started back in the 90s in terms of uh, infusing Afrocentricity and building upon it within our school and, and, and naming it even within our um, student success plan. So um, it's, it's a work in progress. Um, Rachel has been supporting us through her work with the diversity team, and uh, and that's where we are. But I, be, I agree with Ken in terms of the bigger picture. You know, if we keep saying we need an Afrocentric school, you know, outside of the community of North Preston, we just need to do it. We just need to start um, it. My apologies. I'm just not sure who the panel is because I kind of joined the conversation late. I can so tell I'm you the panel. Um, the panel are Anne, um, Barb, Morgan, and Ken Fells. Is it? No, thank you so much for that. I'm just wondering, though, the, the appropriateness of kind of my comment. But just to speak to the conversation around the uh, French Immersion Program, I know a number of years ago, uh, being a part of a, a center of education or a school board, that there were talks when there were cutbacks about eliminating that, that uh, program or reducing the funding. I'm wondering, I'm wondering if it wouldn't be something that we should think about as a community around trying to develop an Afrocentric school to work to access federal funding. The, the rationale behind that is, is that the fact that federal funding is what supports the CSAP um, meant that it was untouchable from a provincial perspective. So when the province was cutting back on funding as it related to the CSAPs, the fact that it was federally funded meant that, that those funds were untouchable. If we're talking about a level of autonomy, given the circumstances of Black Lives Matter and anti-Black racism, and we know we have representation from provincially from our community um, in the Senate and other areas, and this is a topic of conversation, should we not look to access the, uh, a federal conversation around um, uh, protection for, for African Nova Scotian learners, given our histories, you know, stemming from the Black Report and beyond um, to present? Because I think that if we can create a level of protection, the barriers that exist locally from a provincial perspective, uh, we might be able to, to circumnavigate because we, we've learned over the years what they're willing to concede versus what they're willing to to kind of demonstrate in terms of performative allyship that doesn't sustain a change for us. And so going back to Malik's point around accountability, 
um, and, and the point that was brought up earlier around accessing legal representation, we've already established that through the Black Report in terms of we, sh we will and shall. And so how do we hold folks accountable to that beyond, um, you know, beyond what their performative commitment is without actually substantive, um, uh, you know, supports and autonomy of the Black community to make those decisions? That, that's my comment. I just remind you that MK is funded federally, and uh, that's because they're supposed to be one of the founding members, even though Matthew DeCosta brought them on and made sure they got to Nova Scotia. So the thing is, you know, unless we're, we're given third-party status, we'd have to look at that. We're either repercussions or what do you call it? Repercussions or reparations? Yeah, reparations. I'm only joking. We have to get the, if that, the best way to go about that, I think, is reparations from the federal side. I'll close it there so I'm not talking too long. All right, um, Martin, your question was next. Um, I'm hoping that you felt in your comment you might have gotten some feedback on that. Okay. Well, I think this piece was about the accountability. Yes. So yeah. I'm going to move to the next question, and it's from Tess Porter. She wants to know if, uh, does anyone know of a parent mentoring program where parents mentor each other, especially to those parents new to the school system? Would our education committees be a good place to start? Well, we used to offer parent, uh, a parent committee at Auburn and Co Harbor. So, Karen, you want to speak to that or no? If Tessa's question is asking about a black parent um, place or parent, black parents supporting black parents, there's not one that I know of. Uh, I know as a black parent, I put myself on SAC uh, since my children start at school from P to 12 and sometimes on two sacks because that's often the school advisory committee because that's often where decisions are being made and I'm always worried about what's going to happen to my black learners because that's often the committee that makes the decisions around discipline. Um, so I always plot myself in that position. But in terms of parent-to-parent -parent support, um, I wish there was. And, and I've often told myself um, as a parent who has ex uh, a struggle with a child who has challenges that I was going to start one because when you have challenges in the school system, you feel like you're the only one and you become very embarrassed to look for help and to, to talk about it. And you do feel isolated and alone. So there is definitely a need for a support structure for black parents who are going through challenges and also who are going through successes. Um, one of the biggest things we don't put our children in, for instance, is the IB program. Um, and why not? So we need to talk about even those avenues. So it's not just talking about challenges we're having in the school system, but also ex moments of experience success. So I think it's an excellent uh, suggestion and, and would like to see something like that that could be developed because I think it would have a, a, a great impact. So we had that opportunity to do those things. What we did is we had education committees. Those education committees, particularly, there's still some in existence around the province, particularly in Metro. So the education committees, for the most part, are people who are of Black African ancestry, and with blended families, they come as well. So I, I don't know where you're calling from, but I know that uh, that might be a good start to get yourself involved, and that's through the Black Educators Association. There are strong education committees also in New Glasgow and the Anaganish area that are very active and um, vocal in our students' success. So, again, not sure where you're calling from, but... Especially New Glasgow. I am okay. calling. I am calling from Ontario. So you should check with Warren Solomon with the uh, Ontario Alliance of Black School Educators. I'm pretty sure that he would give you the background information for um, getting support for Black learners because they're doing a great job there now. And you could okay. also reach out. You could also reach out to someone I, who who I believe is on the call. Uh, Ms. Brenda Francis, who's a regional educator for uh, the Black Educators Association, they have a human rights case uh, um, that the uh, uh, Tri-County Regional Center of Education is responding to, and they might be able to give you some insights with respect to uh, challenging a center of education in the interest of the Black community. Okay, um, so I just want to say thank you. Sorry that I have to cut people off. I have one last question. 
the time goes fast when we get into a discussion. But like I said earlier, this is the first time, um, well, the first attempt for us to have our education town hall meeting. And um, we will have another one follow up for some of the questions that we didn't get an opportunity to, to address this evening. But before we leave, I'm going to give um, the four panelists the opportunity to just speak to one question that was on the chat there and it may be a way to how we can just um, just in terms of our overall thinking our collective thoughts in terms of uh, someone mentioned about disrupting the current system so that our children are not continually left out and Morgan spoke about that earlier about our children are constantly left out we want them to be stand in so how can we disrupt the system Think about it. So that means the sweet answer you're going to give right now, um, not a story answer, but how do we disrupt our current education system so that our children can experience that and celebrate that excellence and um, celebrate who they are in terms of being people of African descent, African um, Nova Scotian, people of African Canadian, their blackness. So do you want to go reverse and then um, just look out for the next call that we'll have? Probably I won't be on a holiday or falling on the a holiday that would be taking place, but we would do that sometimes in the middle of July, but we will get back to you with that opportunity. Envision your education. We're not done yet. And would you like to start, Morgan, Barb, and Fells? How can we disrupt the system, you're saying? Yes. Um, one point I want to make is we need to, to shake up um, how our children are being judged. You know, when I think of, I just keep hampering on the assessments. When I think of the assessments, the literacy and the math assessments that are designed for our children, and so there you get the, the results of the grade three assessments, so many not meeting, results of the grade 10 assessments, so many not meeting. We need to disrupt um, how these assessments are made up how they are judged. Because I think if, if that many children are not meeting, there's something wrong with the assessment. That's what I want to say. I think we need to start holding people accountable uh, from the top down when we're talking about centers for education, principals, teachers. We have performance appraisals for a reason. Um, you know, this we've been having these conversations for years. Um, we need to be starting, hold, we need to hold people accountable. Either, you know, do it or you got to go. Barb? Yeah, sorry. I was just <laughs> enthralled in all the, the responses. Um, I definitely think I agree with both what has been said, but a lawyer uh, on retainer um, and making people accountable and not being afraid, although I know that for some of us it's our livelihood, but not being afraid to call people out and use the models that are in place and demand excellence for our children and excellence for all of you who are educators. And I applaud you for working with our children and I say thank you um, because of the work that you're doing and you are disrupting the system as educators in a system that don't want you there. And, and, and that in itself is, uh, is a testament to your strength and your resilience. And I wanna say on behalf of black parents who have, school, who have children in the system, thank you. Um, wherever you may be in the system, whatever you may be doing. And that's one way uh, that we continue to disrupt and support each other through that disruption. But having a lawyer on, on, on side and um, keeping people accountable. Els? Disrupting the system? Uh, in my mind, it's very simple. It's human resources. That is the greatest disruption and the greatest problem that any administrator would have. I can't get the teachers that I want. I can't keep the teachers I want. And the teachers are getting frustrated now with the equity hires. We need somebody in human resources, that's number one. And the other thing is we need reflective curriculum outcomes that support our children's immediate needs and greet them where they are. Teach them where they are. And to stop comparing them to other children. They're their own unique individuals. All right, so on that note, I want to just thank you all for those who joined the call, for those who are calling into the call, and for our panelists for your um, wisdom and knowledge and excellent comments and um, words to actually action and ideas to think 
forward in terms of what we need to do, um, and not just us, but others. Because this work is just not about us, it's also our um, allies in terms of doing the work, who's going to be accountable for this work. So thank you for um, assisting us. Uh, once again, I want to say thank you to the Black Culture Center and the Office of African Nova Scotia Affairs for allowing us, in terms of the Black Educator Association, for um, assisting us with hosting this so that we could reach out to those who didn't have technology. So the telephones and also the live stream. And um, it has been live streamed this evening as well. And those who are on YouTube. Thank you also to Rachel for um, watching that chat because there's a lot of information on that chat there. But it could start, it could be the beginning of our next conversation in regards to some of the questions that we didn't get to. And um, we can come back. Enjoy the rest of your weekend, and um, God bless. Okay. Have a great evening, all. Thanks, Karen, and everyone. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Ms. Carter. Thank, Thank you, you for everyone. allowing me to share your space. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.